Welcome to our podcast series, Talking with Traders, hosted by expert trader Garth McKenzie in London, from where he's interviewing various guests on the topic of trading. Welcome to season four of Talking with Traders with me, Garth McKenzie. It's been a lengthy hiatus since we completed season three of this series, so it's good to be back. Thank you to IG Markets for once again coming on board to fund and sponsor this podcast. Their involvement is hugely valuable, and we're proud to have such an award-winning CFD provider alongside us. In this season, I'll welcome back some of our most popular guests from previous seasons to get their updated views on the markets, and I'll also bring in some new guests too. I'll be asking them pertinent questions about how they trade the market and where they're seeing opportunities in the global trading and investing arena. The idea is that you, the listener, gain some valuable insight and education from these market professionals that may be of use in your own trading and investing. So with that in mind, let's get straight into this week's episode of Talking with Traders. Welcome back to Talking with Traders. And this week, I've got a very different guest for you on the line. Uh, His name is Murray Legg. And the discussion today is all about non-fungible tokens, NFTs. You've probably heard the term. You might know a little bit about them or you might know nothing about them. But hopefully, by the end of this interview, you'll come away a lot more fascinated by them as I have become since I sp- spoke to Murray a few days ago and we set up this interview. Murray is an entrepreneur. He was formerly at RMB. He studied engineering. Uh, his most recent venture is as the co-founder of a company called Webfluential. Uh, that's an influencer marketing platform. Uh, he trades and plays in the NFT space. He had an informal NFT fund, which he opened and then closed. And he's going to tell us a whole lot more about NFTs and what they are and how how we use them. So Murray, welcome to Talking with Traders. Thank you so much, Garth. It's such a pleasure to spend some time with you and I love chatting about NFT. So excited to see where this conversation goes. Well, I'm excited to see where it goes as well, because yeah, I, I've heard the term and I've seen a little bit about it. And you know, you see as a, as a financial markets person, you see information being uh, swirled around about the exorbitant prices being paid for NFTs. And I suppose the skeptics among us will say, oh, you know, what on earth is this? This is another bubble, just like cryptos is going to burst. But there's a whole lot more interesting stuff behind this NFT world. And I've certainly had my eyes opened to it over the last couple of days since I've been doing a bit of research for this podcast. But I'm really looking forward to picking your brain and understanding even more about them. But for the for the novice listeners to this podcast, um, let's start with the very ba- basics. What is an NFT? Yeah, I, th- I think that's that's a great place to start. So within the cryptocurrency ecosystem, you have e- everything runs on tokens. So uh, Ethereum is a token, but what's uh, what's u- not unique about a token like Ethereum or Solana is that it's divisible, normally to 18 decimal points. Uh, and new tokens are issued every day and tokens are burnt every day just in the ecosystem. What an NFT is, is, is a token, but it's a special type of token where it's not divisible and, uh, and then it can belong to a, uh, an owner. Uh, it's, an NFT is normally also represented by a piece of art. And typically, the community that exists around that collection of art is what gives that, um, that non, non-fungible token its value. So I guess the easiest way to understand it from a kind of a, a traditional entry point is to imagine all of the 100 Rand notes that are in circulation uh, are all, they all look the same. And if you took one of those and you created your own special piece of art uh, drawing on that 100 Rand note, and then you put it back into circulation, it would be unique um, and not obviously not divisible. And someone might find more value in that 100 Rand note because it had some kind of provenance to it. There was obviously some uniqueness to it, but also it had a particular previous owner and, um, and someone might say, hey, I want to keep that in my uh, wallet. I don't want it to go back into circulation and they attribute some kind of value to it. Okay. So, but if I think about it, just, I guess, using your example of 100 Rand notes and what it, the, the point about a fungible, the word fungible, for those who don't know what it means, is it means that it's 
you know, you can swap it for something the same. There's ma- many of them out there. So typical currency is exactly that. One, a hundred rand note is the same as a different hundred rand note is the same as a different one. And we can swap them and I can buy something with that and then, you know, take another hundred rand from elsewhere. And it's the, the point is that that item is fungible. And I guess a Bitcoin is fungible as well, because one Bitcoin is the same as another Bitcoin is the same as another Bitcoin. Um, where things are non-fungible is where they are, they, 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 they're unique. So to, to extend the definition of the art that you're saying, I mean, I guess the, the Mona Lisa, or you take a famous painting by Van Gogh, there's only one of the original of these items. Um, those are non-fungible. So what you're saying is these things are effectively like those artworks, but they're sitting on the digital platform. They're sitting on the blockchain. That's exactly right. So the Mona Lisa would be a one of one. Yeah. And if you own the Mona Lisa, you own, you would have ownership of that token. So in, in the crypto world, because it's not a physical item, it's a digital item. And typically for these collections of NFTs, um, they exist in any, um, any number from 100, but the most common is 10,000 uh, within a collection. So imagine 10,000 pieces of art, each underpinned by a token and governed by, in the most case, Ethereum blockchain. You do have um, on Cardano and Solana, which are other, other chains uh, with less uh, transaction fees, but Ethereum is sort of the... Um, the staple that uh, the bigger projects typically exist on. And uh, and then each of those 10,000 NFTs are all represented by a piece of generative art or digital art that is often built by a computer program. So um, for each collection, it will have some kind of theme to it, but then each item within that has some degree of scarcity. So an example that uh, your listeners might be aware of it is something like the uh, CryptoPunks or the Border Ape Yacht Club. Mm. Each of those collections are 10,000 uh, NFTs and each item within that is unique. So uh, within the Border Ape Yacht Club, you might have a particular ape that has a certain uh, kind of um, earring. It's got a propeller head um, hat on and it might have um, bloodshot eyes. And that that combination is makes that unique, um, and for each of the ten thousand, they have different um, different scarcities, and the um, the artists behind each collection will have a number of very rare um, items. So they'll only have you know zero point one percent of the of the collection will have a particular trait, um, and then you might have a fl- what they call a flaw trait, which is a very common trait, um, and then you can. I mean, we might might get into a bit of discussing uh, how to buy them and sell them or trade them, but um, but the value is an interesting representation. So, how to value these um, NFTs is sort of a combination of the social capital that exists around the community that owns them, as well as the scarcity of your particular NFT. So, if you have one of the rare ones, and there's a huge amount of value in the community because there's, you know, some uh, celebrities and, and maybe some sportsmen uh, and some kind of uh, Web3 web um, kind of uh, participants that have been around for a long time that hold de- some degree of provenance, then that collection and that NFT might hold a certain value. So it's much like art, except it's uh, you've got a global uh, market to buy and sell. You've got um, a fair degree of liquidity. And um, and then what's interesting is it's all governed by the blockchain. So there's no opportunity for um, for someone to have some kind of ripple for effectively the Mona Lisa. Uh, you can verify on chain that you are in fact that owner of that particular crypto punk. Um, and and as a you know as a digital flex, you might want to share that with your with your audience and say, look at me, I own this really cool piece of art. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, as I'm as I'm listening to you here, I'm thinking uh, with my financial markets hat on, and I'm thinking, right. So, you're saying that these things attract a value, effectively because of the people that are willing to pay whatever it is for these things. Um, and in the financial markets game, I guess we we could sometimes refer to that as the greater fool theory, that you know, you, you bought, bought this piece of art, this digital, this NFT, uh, and the only potential upside for you is that you sell it to somebody else for a higher price later on. 
Um, and we would say, well, there's got to be another fool more foolish than you who's going to pay more for this thing than you did. <laughs> All right. And obviously, I'm saying that with the greatest level of respect. But I mean, am I right in that thinking or, or, or have I got something wrong? Because what you're saying so far to me, it sounds like the, the value of this thing is really it's purely determined by the market of people owning it and what they're willing to pay for it. There's no particular cash flow or it's not like like anything like a share in a company you know that you're buying a future stream of earnings um in this case it sounds to me like it's almost like you're buying a kruger rand or you're buying a piece of art you know something that's going to give you no utility or no cash flow in the future all you're hoping is that someone else will pay more for it later on have i got that right or am i am i on the wrong track there <laughs> No, I, I think that's uh, that's a very circumspect, uh, considered way of thinking about these collections. And absolutely, that that is definitely a lens that you you might um, think about these. The, um, the the counter to that, I guess, is to say, you know, the the collective community belief that an ounce of gold is worth worth a certain value is exactly the same methodology mm. that's applied to a collection of um, of crypto punks. Yeah. So. It's the belief by a number of people that these hold value. So there's the value element, but also there's the community element. So right. uh, with uh, Web3 and, and uh, holding certain tokens in your wallet, it allows you to go to interesting places. So imagine that your token allows you to log in. And unless you own that token, token you can't log into a particular place. So, for example, um, this community aspect. So in the, the Board API Club, Serena Williams, Justin Bieber, Jimmy Fallon, Eminem are a number of the celebrities that own one or many board apes. And with that token, you can log into a particular place and you can chat with, with uh, all the apes and you can chat to Serena and Justin. So if you feel that there's value in having exclusive access to that community and that there's some kind of value to that, you, you would also have a reason to not sell that particular token. Okay. Um, it's even going as far as uh, in the decentralized finance space that you can put your uh, NFT up as collateral to take a loan. And, um, and then there's also communities who will club together, um, particularly for the, the higher value items. They'll club together and they'll purchase um, a number of these pieces of art in a way, fractionalizing them. Mm. Um, so um, yeah, it's a, it's a, I think it's a very early space. I mean, the rise of NFTs only really happened in September of last year. A lot of these collections that are now worth, um, you know, they have market caps of billions of dollars um, were only created, you know, not even two years ago. Um, and, and there's going to be a lot of evolution as to how these uh, evolve. And, and to your point, they could all go to zero. Um, but, but I think, you know, the, there are some blue chips that are starting to emerge. And I think there's some interesting use cases that get put, put forward for them. And I think we're in phase one of understanding what an NFT is. But what phase two is starting to emerge is this utility behind an NFT and the community aspects to artists um, and uh, musicians and celebrities and how they might use them to take better ownership of um, of those communities because for a long time we've relied on centralized services like youtube and instagram and clubhouse and uh, these kind of technology providers that allow people access to the community that enjoys them but as soon as that centralized service changes its mind changes its rules updates its uh, feed or algorithms behind it you you lose access to your community or it changes the relationship that you have. And NFTs allow for a much, um, a much more direct and a much more decentralized approach to that community engagement where you can, you can keep that community for years to come. Okay. Okay. This is fascinating. What, what, what gets me more curious though, is these various use cases, because that, that aspect around the, you know, being able to access certain clubs and gives you a login to talk with certain celebrities and all that. That's, that's interesting. But what other use cases are there? And, and to the point where, you know, can these things attract a cash flow? 
you know, if you own a share of a company, you know that you, you're you entitled to a share of the company's earnings and that gets paid to you as a dividend at some point or in the form of a, a rising stock price. Um, but can an NFT attract a cash flow so that you, you're effectively earning off that NFT and that then it's not just a you know, piece of digital art that you can be proud to own? Is are there, is there ability to get a cash flow from one of these things? Absolutely. I, I think there's, there's two ways to think about it. So um, this emergence of musicians starting to issue, um, issue their songs as NFTs is an interesting first step. And uh, what, they, what they call buying at the mint. So when a token is uh, supply is minted, any people can go and buy it at the mint price and they can hold it in their wallet. And the creator or the artist um, or the musician who released that particular collection can program into the token a certain percentage of royalty that they earn for any subsequent sale. So, I mean, if you imagine a, a painter or an artist, when they sell their first piece of art, that's the last time they see any economic upside from it. With an NFT, Every time that there's a subsequent sale, they for in an eternity from the point of minting, they could earn anything from you know a percent or two up to you know northwards of that. Every time there's a subsequent uh, sale, so as these things uh, appreciate in value, and and if they do, the artist stands to benefit. So that would be one cash flow. Um, another cash flow for for owners is because. Um, owners of tokens have this kind of exclusivity. Other projects and other, um, other artists might want to piggyback onto the owners of other tokens. So the um, crypto world is all open ledger. So anybody can see what's inside anybody else's wallet. It's as if everyone's bank accounts are in the public domain. And if I held an interesting NFT. It allows another project to say, oh, you're an owner of this NFT, so I'm going to airdrop you something that I think you'll find of value. And so you'll find other NFTs piggyback on existing projects. Um, so that's a way of uh, the, the owners earning an income by getting gifted these, um, these NFTs. And then there's also, um, there's also projects like exchanges. So OpenSea is, is sort of the highest volume exchange. Uh, where people buy and sell NFTs. But late December last year, there was a competitor that launched, um, they called it a vampire tactic, where they looked on the Ethereum blockchain and they found anybody that had traded more than three ETH in NFTs in the last six months of last year was airdropped a number of these, um, not NFT tokens, but LUX tokens. And, um, and those LUX tokens you could stake or you could sell, but depending on your, the number of transactions that you've done and the volume of NFTs you've bought and sold in the previous year, you stood to earn a gift of anything from five to fifty thousand dollars. So that's a secondary, almost uh, I wouldn't say dividend, but a way to earn an income um, from from other projects that are building in the ecosystem, and then also, of course, from from the royalty from subsequent sales. Okay. All right. I'm thinking with my own hat on here. I mean, I've got uh, I'm an in investor in a theater production. And uh, at this point in time, you know, the hope is that this one day ends up on Broadway or the West End in London. Um, right now, all I've really got is a contract with the producer of this production. I'm just thinking aloud here. Could that thing theoretically then be issued as a, that, that contract could actually be an NFT? And then that, that's kind of gives me almost greater certainty, I guess. It sits on the blockchain and that and, and, and any royalties, any future uh, fees that that theater production earns could get paid in back via, via the NFT. Would I be right in that thinking? So a, a great uh, use case for NFTs is exactly that, where theaters or artists could issue their, the tickets to their events as NFTs Mm -hmm. And those NFTs just live on in their wallets. And in the future, so say, for instance, your um, theater production had, had run on Broadway and then they were opening on the West End, they could just airdrop a voucher to 
to all of the people that had ever gone to watch it um, that they can now go and watch it in, in a new location. So that's that's definitely a, a way to think about um, about doing that. And then um, and then having that the history because you know the NFTs will will live on um, in in that wallet for for forever. So so that's definitely a, a way to to look at at how to do that. Okay. Fascinating. You mentioned um, exchanges where you can trade these. And I think this is where I want to bring it back to the listener who, who's now interested and says, right, I'm keen, um, but I want it now I want to go and buy an NFT. How do I go about doing that? So I'd say that the first place to start is that you, um, you should be comfortable with cryptocurrency in the form of having an exchange account. Mm. So, Opening an exchange account and depositing your fiat, dollars, pounds, euros, rands, and purchasing Ethereum. Um, so, so doing that first transaction. And once you've done that, you want to take the ETH, which lives on the exchange, and you want to transfer it to your own wallet. So a self-custody wallet. So an example would be MetaMask, um, which allows you to have um, ownership of, of your tokens as opposed to them living on an exchange and being exposed to the risk that the exchange is hacked and that, and that you could lose them. Here, you, um, you, you have access to them through your own wallet that you control. And once the ETH are on that MetaMask account or, or a similar, uh, similar wallet, like a Coinbase wallet, uh, you'd be able to connect that wallet to OpenSea or LooksRare and then browse through the collections of, uh, of NFTs and find the one that you love, and then you can purchase it. So instead of buying it with, with fiat, you're buying it with, uh, with ETH, and that contract is uh, recorded on chain. So there's a seller or you bought it at the mint, and there's, there's a transaction that happens uh, that you confirm through your wallet, and then that NFT moves to your wallet, and you can then do with it what you wish. You could display it, uh, you could... Uh, what I think a lot of people might be aware of is is on Twitter how people's profile pictures have moved away from being pictures of themselves to being these animated little caricatures. So mm. they're called PFPs, profile pictures, and um, and you're actually representing yourself as that as that um, NFT. Twitter also did an interesting integration where you can connect your Twitter account to OpenSea, and then you can choose an NFT that you own, and that can. Uh, you can use that as your profile picture. Um, and, and that would be a, a way to, to buy your first NFT. And then you can go to OpenSea and you can look at what they call the floor price. The floor price is the cheapest token in that collection, how much uh, that's, that's currently listed for. And that gives you a sense of what, uh, what you might be able to sell yours for. But you could list it for a price that you feel is the, is the price that you'd like to sell it at. So if you bought it one ETH and you wanted to sell it two, you could list it at two, and then someone else could come along and say that they really like that and they're happy to buy it, and they, then you earn your two ETH less uh, any royalties that went back to the artist and any exchange fees, um, and then and then that NFT transfers to the new owner's wallet, and and that's basically how how you buy and sell. <laughs> You're listening to Talking With Traders, a podcast series brought to you by IG, a world-leading online trading and investment provider. If you haven't checked out the IG online trading platform, please do so and visit IG.com. Also, make sure you subscribe to the podcast series on your favorite podcast app or website by clicking on the subscribe button and you'll be notified weekly as we release new episodes. So OpenSea sounds like it's the, the most common exchange then the, from what you're saying. You've mentioned that a number of times. I know there are others. You said about looks rare and there's others as well, but it sounds like OpenSea is the most common one, right? It is. And I mean, no one had heard of any of these really um, a number of months ago. And from about August of last year, OpenSea has delivered massive trading volumes. It's sort of in the order of... Um, 20 to 30 billion dollars a month in volume that go, that goes through those exchanges um, they recently raised funding at a 13 billion dollar uh, valuation and then looks rare is a competitor and you can buy 
by effectively the, the share or the equity ownership of Luxray in the form of a token. And, um, and you can obviously see the market cap of that, but that, that opened overnight. So a company that didn't exist um, in January, in its first month of existence, uh, was trading at around uh, $6 billion in, in, in market cap. Wow. Amazing. What, what's the average cost of, a, of an NFT? And I mean, I know that's probably a very broad question because it's like, what's the average cost of any piece of art? It could be one rand, it could be a hundred million rand, I guess. But is there, have you got a number? If, if someone's wanting to get started, they want to get their feet wet um, and try this out without betting the farm, as it were, you know, are they able to access an NFT for a relatively affordable price? They are. So most collections start out at minting at a price range between 0.025 and 0.1 ETH. And, and that's, you know, in, in today's terms, um, between sort of 500 and 5,000 Rand. Um, and I mean, the, the crypto punks, uh, which were minted in 2019, they were actually, you could mint them for free. You just paid the gas fee. Um, there was there was no fee to the creator, and um, and these you know these collections trade. So most collections end up going nowhere, and you know there's a little bit of hype and community around them, but uh, but they never really get out of the starting blocks, and they typically go to zero, and you're just holding the art because you love it. But yeah. some of the um, the collections like um, the Cool Cats, the um, the Doodles, the Board Ape Yacht Club, um, the Crypto Punks. Those trade currently uh, from you know ten ETH up to, I mean, there's a, there's often transactions of a board ape or a or a crypto punk north of a million dollars. So, and for listeners that are interested, you can go and uh, spend some time on Twitter, and you can find people that have literally been in in debt and with no real hope invested their time, energy, effort, and, and social capital into the space. And they have, um, they have really done exceptionally well. And for sure, it comes with a huge amount of risk because the space is so early. Uh, but it's, it's a fascinating part of, of the web. And it's, there's, there's great people doing really interesting things with, with NFTs. And, um, and yeah, there's, I mean, I wouldn't do it just for the sake of trying to earn a return, mm. but uh, but there is definitely that opportunity um, if you buy at the right time in the right collection. That's amazing. And, and I guess the question then is, how do you know what what is the right time and what is the right <laughs> collection? That's the million dollar question, right? I guess it's like you you back an artist, for, you know, to, to does some painting, and you hope that one day maybe that artist is the next Van Gogh or the next William Kentridge, but you just don't know. Or is there a is there a secret source? You don't know. And, and it's really, you want to try and get a few dimensions to it. And normally the ones to look at are who are the founders? Do they have some kind of track record in art and uh, programming? You want to look at the community that exists around it. So um, are there some celebrities? Are there some, you know, people that are, that are promoting this, um, you know, for the right reasons? You want to look at the art to see, you know, how diverse is the spectrum, how rare are the most rare pieces, and how average are, are you know, are the floor pieces, and um, and then it's it's also market timing. So you want to look at things like, um, you know, volume traded in a day, um, volatility of price over the last few weeks. Um, NFTs are almost a hedge against um, uh, running crypto prices because as um, as, as crypto prices come off, typically NFT prices increase because they hold effectively a dollar value. Mm. And then, and then they ratchet the other way. So then as the ETH price runs, all of the people that are owning, that, that own, um, these collections, you know, they enjoy the free ride. So then everything runs up in value and then it kind of resets at a, at a, a dollar value peg. And then, and then it kind of ratchets the other way again. So it's, um, it is. It's it's an interesting thing to do, um, and there's, there's. I wouldn't say there's a science behind it, but there's definitely um, this uh, opportunity for, I guess, people interested in in the bleeding edge of finance as to how to get involved. Um, you know, how to put a bit of risk on the book and expose themselves to this asset class because it's a very interesting one. 
And I think a confirmation of that is brands starting to get involved in the space. So imagine when you buy a pair of Nikes that you are also issued a digital twin of those Nikes. So I can wear Nikes around um, around the mall and around the city and people that see me will say, you know, that those look like a cool pair of shoes. But now when when I exist in my digital version of myself, so in the metaverse, and I start going on to places like Decentraland and the Sandbox, I can also wear those Nikes, a digital version of them on my avatar. And that becomes effectively a, you know, a representation of my identity in a, in a Web3 world. But it also offers me an opportunity to do unique things with those Nikes. So Nike actually owns the patent for um, being able to breed uh, NFTs. So if I had a particular pair of shoes and you had another, there might be a contract that someone's uh, written that allows us to breed our shoes together and have some mutation uh, as a result. (laughs) And other people might want to buy those. So it's a little bit of a... It's a little bit of a, um, a discomfort and a little bit of a, a weird way of thinking about the world. But I mean, how many of us have now spent more time in front of a computer screen and on a Zoom call than we have in person in, in offices in the last two years? Sure. So naturally, this is, a, this is a way to represent ourselves in an online world as opposed to hanging art in our, in our house and wearing the shoes that we do around the gym. Now, this is a way that we can do those things in a digital setting and engage with, with a whole new community and, um, and have a way to connect with people because we have something in common. Okay. All right. I sort of go back to the point around this, the celebrity thing, because now, again, with my financial markets hat on, I'm thinking, surely this, is, this opens it up to manipulation. Let's say, you know, I, I know a particular celebrity. Um, just say Ed Sheeran, for example, um, and we somehow we concoct this NFT and we mint it and we put it on the exchange and then we release the news that Ed Sheeran is now a buyer of these of, of, of this community of NFTs and suddenly these things are going to explode in value. Is it as simple as that? I mean, and, and am I right in saying that that potentially, I guess, opens it to manipulation? And is that even manipulation or is that just... It's just the way the world works. So there's definitely a form of that um, in, in misrepresentation of artists. So someone might take a copy of a collection uh, of particular NFTs and issue a new token with those same images attached and claim that that is in fact the, you know, the verified collection. So that can happen. Then the second thing that can happen is effectively wash trading where you can buy and sell your own NFT. I think, uh, I think Melania Trump did this recently where she issued her own NFT and then bought it from a, a unique wallet for a couple hundred thousand dollars and then claimed that it was worth something, but it was actually her being the issuer and the buyer herself. So you could definitely do that. So, you know, a wallet doesn't, mean that you're a a verified individual you know any person can own any number of wallets and you can just wash trade between between them and 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 drum up the price if you wanted to um so so there's definitely you know cause for concern and there, there can be market manipulation and there's no regulation because the space is so early so it definitely comes with its risks so i mean there's there's a couple of uh phrases that people will become familiar with um the most common is is just GM, which is good morning. That's where people want to share, um, you know, just a hi to the shout out to the community. But another one is DYOR, do your own research. And um, and there there are a lot of um, instances where where these um, when you know where people get scammed or they buy the wrong thing, they get done out of some of their money. Um, and it really is. It's it's up to the individual to make sure that they've researched it properly and they've looked, you know, behind the, the image into the token, uh, maybe looked at the smart contract, done a little bit of a due diligence, and then and then been happy that they they bought the right thing. Okay. This is fascinating. My head is just uh, bulging with all of this information and I'm thinking about all the possibilities. But what's the current market capitalization of the NFT market? Do you know? It's an, 
it's an interesting one to to kind of dissect because what you're effectively doing when you when you take your liquid ETH and you put it into an NFT is you're effectively putting your money on deposit. So you're taking your ETH out of circulation and holding it in some asset. And so you're decreasing the circulating supply of ETH, which is a really good thing for, for ETH because then with less circulating supply, with more demand, the price should go up. Um, the, the market cap um, of, of ETH is um, at the moment about, uh, I think it's about $800 billion. Um, and then, and then the, there's, there's two things. One, one is what is the NFT market cap within that? And then also looking at other chains like Solano and Cardano, what, are, what is the NFT market cap within those? So I'm not sure exactly. It's a, it's a percentage within that. I'd, I'd say um, it's sort of in the range of probably 75 to $150 billion at the moment is the market cap of, of all the NFTs. It's also a different, you know, one also wouldn't say that there's enough capital to go and buy every single um, NFT at the moment. So if, if there was a run on them and everybody had to sell, that would, that would come right back. So a little bit difficult to say exactly what that's worth. So, so on OpenSea or um, on the analytics, they typically look at the volume traded um, you know, per, per day, per month. And then within that, which are the collections uh, that are picking up a, a lot of trading volume. Okay. All right. Interesting. While I've been sitting here and doing a little bit of Googling as you've been talking, and suddenly some, a thought popped into my head is these images, these, the Google Doodle that comes up every day. Um, this today's one, I mean, it's the 15th of February. We're recording this today's Google doodle is the lantern festival. And, um, you know what I'm talking about. You go into Google and there's a different image Mm -hmm. on most days on Valentine's day. Yesterday, there was a, you know, Google image was in with a picture of a heart and love and all of that. Um, now those things I I presume, you know, must also be, is, are those available as an NFT? Do you know? So an interesting uh, use case is, is Time Magazine. So what they did was they took every cover of Time Magazine that's ever existed and they minted those as NFTs. So uh, people that found value or importance, maybe because of the year that they were born in or, or you know, had the anniversary or whatever, whatever it was, could go and buy those. And, um, and I think you know, brands are experimenting on how exactly to use NFTs um, and it's an interesting one. So I think brands believe that their, their items are worth probably a lot more than they are to the consumer. Um, but like we're starting to see, so Nike, Nike's a great example. So Artifact is a, um, is a digital art um, uh, creator that has recently um, created the Clonex collection of NFTs. And uh, Nike bought Artifact. And if you owned a clone, um, you're now getting, you just got gifted or airdropped um, a box uh, NFT. And inside the box is something which is yet to be revealed, but people believe that it's some kind of Nike um, access, whether it's to events or, um, or to, to gear or vouchers or discounts. Um, it's currently speculative, but uh, there is some kind of value to it. I mean, one of those boxes is, is trading at four ETH, so 200,000 Rand. Um, so hopefully there's, oh. there's enough value to substantiate that amount of, of value, but I think brands will see, um, you know, th- they're going to experiment with these, um, for the moment, just building their community, understanding, um, the economics of how these things work and, uh, and obviously appreciating the scarcity element of it. Yeah. This is so interesting. Can these things get stolen? I mean, I think you kind of alluded to it already, but it's they sit on the blockchain. So from that perspective, there's, uh, I guess, there's an, an element of safety. But you read stories about crypto exchanges getting hacked and cryptocurrency getting stolen uh, fairly regularly nowadays. How safe is an NFT? It's a great question. And I think it's something for listeners to be mindful of. So, when you own an NFT, it does, the token doesn't live on your computer. It doesn't live in your hardware wallet. It doesn't live on the exchange. It doesn't live on OpenSea. It lives on chain 
and nothing can, can change that. By owning it, you have access to, to that NFT and it is, uh, lives, is associated with your wallet. And then you can transfer it to someone else's wallet, either by sending it there or effecting a transaction because someone bought it from you. But the gateway between how you, between how you get to that NFT is, is obviously through a wallet. Um, could be a Coinbase wallet, could be a MetaMask wallet. And so you don't have a username and password. You've got a what they call a, um, a f- secret phrase and a, um, and a password. So it's 12 or 24 words that unscramble or decrypt access to your wallet. And if you share those words with someone else, they can emulate access to your wallet and they can, they can move out whatever's in there. So that's, that's what you, that, that's your biggest risk is, is if you reveal those, uh, your, your secret words to, to anybody, then they can, they can take what's in your wallet. They can steal your NFTs. Um, but typically people are protecting themselves by using a hardware wallet um, and making sure that they, they've saved those words on a piece of paper in a very safe space and never saved them on the computer. And as long as you're doing that and looking after your assets, you, you should be fine. Yeah. I was going to say, I mean, it's all very well, but can it get lost? And I guess that's the point. If you forget your secret phrase you, you, and you can't get into the wallet, then it's as, as good as lost, isn't it? Exactly. And, and you hear stories about people who've um, forgotten their seed phrase or that they had, um, had a hardware wallet, you know, and now ended up in a, in, a, uh, in a rubbish dump somewhere. Now they want to excavate the entire rubbish dump to try and find that, um, <laughs> which, which is often quite difficult to do. <laughs> it's also interesting from, a, I'm just thinking from an inheritance perspective, you know, because this whole thing is so decentralized. You kind of, in, in a way, I guess this opens, a, it's a, it could be a, a vehicle to, to bypass inheritance taxes and all that kind of thing. Now, we, I guess we're getting into dangerous territory with this conversation, right? But, I mean, what's stopping me putting all of my assets into an NFT and then I tell my kids what the special word is, the special phrase, so that they can access it when I'm gone? And this is all completely decentralized. The, the various tax revenue services know nothing about it. Yeah. And I guess the opposite could happen as well is if no one knows how to access um, your seed phrase, then when you, if you did pass away, those, those assets would live on chain and no one would ever be able to access them. Mm. Sure. <laughs> what a <laughs> fascinating world. What a fascinating world. Um, we, we getting towards the end of our allotted time with this, this interview, Murray, um, I could talk to you all day though. This is so fascinating, but if somebody wanted to find out more and they're interested in this conversation that we've had, they'd like to learn more about NFTs, where would they go, uh, to do that? And then I think also I'd like you to just give us a little bit of an insight into a fund that I know you said you're launching around NFTs as well. So let's just start with the first question. Where would someone go to learn more about these things? Thanks, Garth. The, um, the space is, is so inclusive and so community-driven that I'd encourage people to, um, to go and follow a few interesting people on, on Twitter. So just um, so type in NFT and see who come, comes up there and, and you, there's a few accounts to follow. I'd also, you know, the, the, one of the best ways to learn is, is having skin in the game. So if you had to go and, you know, buy a few ETH and put them onto a MetaMask wallet, connect that to OpenSea and an experiment, you know, go and buy, um, go and buy something that, that you love and, and learn to buy and sell on there. And, and as a result, you'll, You'll join the Discord channel and the, you'll follow them on Twitter and you can engage with other people in the community. Um, so, so that would probably be another place to learn. And then there's, there's obviously a lot of material coming out about, you know, uh, the one-on-one on how to get, get going with NFTs. Um, I think there's, yeah, there, there's some great uh, commentators in, in the space. And I think if, if anything for, for the listeners today, that, if they haven't been aware of NFT, they're going to start hearing about it a whole lot more over the coming months and years. 
um, because it really is such a great utility for, for the web and gives the power back to the individual and the artist to really manage um, their assets and their art in interesting ways. Um, and then, you know, my, my sort of um, approach to it, and, you know, aside from my day job, have been interested in investing into NFTs. So an informal club that we put together, um, a good friend of mine based out of Amsterdam is a, is a curator of NFTs. And we pulled together funds from um, a few friends and family. And we put that to work um, by buying a collection. So you get the leverage of, um, of the collective buying. So you can buy a few of the blue chips that um, are at a, at a bit more of a premium than what, than what you might want to buy yourself. And, um, and just over the last four months, we, uh, we started the fund, uh, invested into a number of projects. We, we lucked out on, on one or two items that ran pretty well. Um, and we returned a, a really healthy return to, to the people that participated. Um, and with those learnings in mind, we're going to be putting a more formal fund together um, in, the, in the coming weeks um, that will allow people the same exposure. So not just the economic um, ability to expose themselves to, to the market, but also the, um, the community and our internal chat where we uh, we educating and learning um, uh, together with with the, the people that invested into the fund, and then um, and then having degrees of governance um, to ensure that the uh, that the fund is well maintained, um, and then yeah, we we'll see where see where that goes in the in the long term. But if any listeners are interested in uh, exploring that a bit, bit more, um, I'll ask you to just share a link in your show notes after, after we've recorded, and they're welcome to to join there and uh, and we can pick it up with them from there yeah and i guess they can also follow you on twitter as i guess it's also a good place to start right they're welcome to so, um, so, i don't tweet all that much but uh, they're welcome to follow me on uh, at murray leg and i i do have a currently um as my avatar a, um, a doodle which i quite enjoy and and now and then i'll i'll tweet about it and um, and also just, you know, welcome to, to see who I'm following because I enjoy um, following people that are talking about, obviously, the, you know, the, these collections that, that I enjoy participating in. Yeah. So that's what I was just going to say. You know, you might not tweet very much, but um, the, the listeners could go and see who you follow and get a, you know, start to build a, a resource base, I guess, of information sources to, to start learning more about NFTs. So your Twitter is at Murray Lake two R's and leg with two G's at the end, Murray leg. That's the one. Yeah. All right. Super. Well, Murray, that's, that's all we've got time for today. It's really been a very, very interesting conversation. I've thoroughly enjoyed chatting to you. Um, so thanks so much again for your time and, and perhaps we can get you back on the show at a later stage again, once this thing gets more traction, uh, I'm sure I'll probably have even more questions in the future. So yeah, thanks for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for hosting me, and uh, I'm glad that we've we've explored some of the, the early stages of this uh, very fascinating space in NFTs. Yeah, thanks very much. If you're a listener listening to this podcast and you've enjoyed it, please uh, go and give us some feedback on your chosen uh, podcast platform. We'd appreciate it. We always value listener feedback. That's it for this week, and I'll be back again with another podcast for you next week. Thanks very much. Cheers. Thanks for joining us for today's episode of Talking With Traders, brought to you by IG, a world-leading CFD provider. We really are privileged to have such a leader in the field of online trading involved in this series. Please follow us on Facebook and engage with us there. And a reminder to make sure you subscribe to this series by clicking on the subscribe button on your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we'd also appreciate if you'd leave a review on the app too. Till next time.